All right, uh, those are the magic words. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I just want to start with uh, a brief uh, shout out to the GOAT. Uh, that was quite a game on uh, Sunday, 31 to nine. So uh, hopefully that made everybody uh, smile and, and uh, a little bit happier. Uh, I think this morning uh, 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 we're going to start out with a very brief uh, uh, COVID update uh, that Brian uh, uh, Cummings is going to give us. Uh, but I would like again to thank uh, Dr. Trent for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, and Priya, I believe uh, you're going to be introducing Dr. Trent. So let's hear from Brian uh, briefly uh, first, uh, and then we can move on to the talk for the morning. Thank you. Brian? Okay. All right. Just a quick um, few words on COVID. All right, so as many of you are aware, there is a rapid decline in the cases throughout the US in both uh, cases and hospitalizations of COVID-19 uh, for unfair reasons, uh, but it is going down. Um, uh, the same is true in Massachusetts with a rapid decline in cases and a decrease of about 1,000 in hospitalizations in the last month. Uh, so all good news. Um, and that is also consistent with what we have here at MGB. The top is just all the trends at all the uh, MGB network uh, hospitals, the ED positivity rate is going down, the overall case rates going down, um, and the amount of admitted has gone down pretty uh, uh, significantly. And just on the bottom again is what's going on at MGH itself. We've had, an, uh, even though we were flat with cases last week, we've gone down uh, nicely. So there's 81 total, total COVID cases at MGH right now and just a very few pediatric cases. Uh, so all good news there. On the vaccination front, you know, the CDC has to adjust their color scheme again because um, everything is the same color. Um, there's now 31 million people that have gotten their first dose. Um, and so uh, still uh, that's been ramping up pretty quickly. In Massachusetts, we've now got about 600,000 people have gotten their first dose. Um, and as you guys have heard, we expanded to patient uh, vaccinations of over age 75. Uh, unfortunately, at MGB, uh, that, that went well last week, but it's actually going to go on pause this week. Uh, the state didn't give us any more vaccine uh, because of um, concern we hadn't been using all of it. And so they were pr prioritizing all the mass vaccination sites. Uh, so they're really ramping up Foxborough, um, Fenway, um, and the mall out in Chicopee. Um, so um, Patients can still get their vaccines at all those mass vaccination sites if they're over age 75. And just a word about the next phase of eligibility, which will be over age 65, or those with two comorbidities, which could include some of our pediatric patients. Um, that we hope will, will happen in the coming weeks or by March. Um, and just uh, for those interested in MGB internally, uh, there is a group looking at the weighted lottery for how patients will be offered those vaccines. And specifically for the age 16 to 18, Alexi and Vanna and I were asked to help the committee make sure we are identifying those patients correctly. Uh, just a final word on the MGB community. Our rates have been coming down as well. They're half of what they were at the beginning of January, down from uh, almost 17% to 8% last week. Still pretty spread throughout the communities. Um, interestingly, we are testing more uh, preschool patients than we are teenagers. Um, although the teenager rate is much higher, it's about double the positivity rate than our preschool patients. Uh, so you can see that in the bottom right. My final plug, just a reminder uh, to vaccinate your patients for influenza, even though it's no longer mandatory in Massachusetts. Uh, we know the death rate from influenza is twice that of COVID-19 in pediatric patients um, and uh, hospitalizations are much higher than COVID-19. So this is something you can do now to prevent uh, illness in children. Good news is we're up to 80% of our inpatients and specialty visits have uh, documentation of flu vaccine this year. This is double we've had last year, which is the best we've ever done. So kudos to all of you making this happen. And um, so with that I'm happy to take any uh, questions in the chat, but we'll move on to our speaker. Priya, it's all yours. Sounds good. So I'm honored to introduce Dr. Maria Trent, a personal mentor and the chief of the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, the Adolescent Medicine Fellowship Training Director, Professor of Pediatrics and Public Health 
at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is a leader in adolescent and young adult reproductive health and an incredible clinician, educator, and human being. Dr. Trent, we are so lucky and privileged to have you giving our annual Black History Month Grand Rounds today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just going to share my screen. So today I'm going to talk with you a bit about the impact of racism on child and adolescent health. It's a topic that I've been working on for the last several years and um, has really had a transformative effect in some organizational leadership roles that I've had. Um, and so the objectives for today are really to describe the levels of racism and the reemergence of racism as a key uh, determinant of health, to discuss the potential impacts of discrimination on children and families, and to incorporate a cultural competency raising resistors approach uh, to anticipatory guidance and scientific innovation as really key strategies for reducing health disparities. So my premise is really that children and adolescents are the message that we send to a time that we cannot see and that we have to act swiftly to ensure that the message we send is a decisive one. Currently in our society over the last year, in particular, we have been struggling um, with the deaths of young people and older people um, of all ages, certainly in the African-American community um, at the hands of police violence, um, which has led to protests around the country. People talk about our civil rights leaders and harken back. You often see quotes throughout, particularly throughout Black History Month. Um, but the reality is that King and X were both assassinated, and we have lost many of our giants um, like John Lewis um, today. It's interesting because I think sometimes I'm challenged as an adolescent health doctor um, as I think about uh, the case in um, Ohio of Tamir Rice and how strikingly similar 14-year-old Emmett Till many years ago in the 1940s really had um, in terms of their age and their deaths um, really um, at the hands of people who weren't thinking about child health or didn't see children uh, when they looked at them. Um, I, I, you know, when I put them side by side, it really does have a powerful impact. And I think as an adolescent doctor, I still see them. I still see their youth but I think that they're not seen that way in the community all the time. And it's an important challenge for me to think about, particularly because when we look at um, firearm disparities in the United States, uh, we really do see the deaths of young people um, to be significant. Uh, when you look at non-Hispanic black children, the rates are sixfold and Latino um, almost threefold. And so we really do have to change things in terms of, of death rates in the United States. COVID-19 has had a significant impact on communities, um, but you see the, the intersectionality between race and who has COVID, who's working on the front lines, who has access to the vaccine, where the vaccine sites are located, where testing is located. And I think we see public health disparities emerge, not just so much for young people who have often just been um, isolated at home or um, really are not a core part other than that of mitigation factors, but their parents and their grandparents and often um, um, families of color live in intergenerational homes. And so the impact um, on them can be significant. And so for me, I just think a lot about what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. And so I do believe that every generation has to make a dent in the wall of injustice. Um, uh, and I'm quoting Dr. Mary Frances Berry. And we see that young people are stepping into that space. These are pictures taken by a teenager um, here from my community um, of the um, protests in uh, Baltimore. Uh, but we also see young other young people around the country. I think this is the thing that gives me most hope that other children see that um, African-American lives, Black lives, that they also matter to them and that it is going to be a transformative thing if we can support all young people in engaging in transformation change, that they will not actually be divided, that we will not actually be divided. I think the impacts of, of COVID on the developmental milestones are significant. Uh, while people tend to 
to think about adolescents as being sort of uh, super spreaders or, or asymptomatic carriers. And so we're just gonna keep them all home. They are missing key developmental milestones and it's particularly traumatizing for uh, individuals living in communities of color uh, that are low income where internet access may be spotty. Um, it's important that we think about what it is that people might be missing um, across the age spectrum. You see a very young child here. What does she need in first grade to make her successful? And then what transitions do these other young ladies really need to move into their future? So I think I decided uh, a couple years ago that I just wasn't going to accept the things I, you know, I couldn't couldn't change, and I was just going to try to change the things I couldn't accept. I think that the tasks I think are Herculean, and so this is sort of my approach to how I'm working. Um, and I, I worry about this because I think the United States is projected to become more racially and ethnically diverse in the coming years. Um, and yet our investments in children overall compared to other countries are actually quite small. Um, we don't necessarily see our future um, in the same way. And the investments we make in adolescents are often spotty, um, haphazard. Um, we're not even investing in how many people we train to actually take really good care of adolescents. So they are seeking care all over the place. The other challenge we have is that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. I'm thoughtful about some of the work done in Baltimore that really demonstrates from the demonstrates um, through the School of Education that we have talented, gifted youth all over our city, but we have not been able to connect them with the resources they need to be functioning at their optimal vocational and academic achievement. And for me, that is a tremendous loss. And so what I think are that young people are looking for heroes. They're looking for people who are going to step into the fray and to help us um, uh, transform society in a way that's going to be meaningful for them. I think over the last year, they've also seen adults potentially behaving badly and are trying to interpret what that means. What is the right thing um, for me to do as I make decisions about who I'm going to become? I think I, I have worked at Hopkins. I think people may be aware that recently it was discovered um, that despite his um, uh, reported anti-racist stance on, um, on healthcare, healthcare access, um, that he owned slaves in Baltimore. I think they identified two to three slaves and it was groundbreaking in Baltimore. I, it, you know, what were people gonna do? But the reality is that I think that he became ill later before he, you know, he was ill before he died. And um, although he didn't die of this particular illness, um, but it changed him in terms of who took care of him, who had access to care. And he still wrote in his, in, in his letter to the trustees that our job was to take care of the indigent sick of the city within its environs without regard to sex, age, or color who require surgical or medical treatment, who can be received into the hospital without peril to inmates and the poor of the city and state of all races. So he says it twice, who are stricken down by any casualties shall be really received into the hospital without charge. And so there was a real clear um, purpose and drive to the work and and so I think it just challenges us in Baltimore that we have to be better. I don't think many people realize that Baltimore was the seat of the transatlantic slave trade. Ships would come to Baltimore and then slaves would be transported south. And so places that people really think of is really fabulous in Baltimore, Oriole Stadium, the Inner Harbor, uh, Fells Point. Those were all key places in the North American transatlantic slave trade. I think that they have been transformed, but I think it just reminds us of the work we still have to do in Baltimore because of the segregated city and the health disparities that exist there. But what I'm excited about is being a part of an organization like the American Academy of Pediatrics. When we look at the blueprint for children, this is the old version, uh, but it's the version that I used to start doing some of the work with them is that the AAP um, wants to address factors that make some children more vulnerable than others, such as race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability, and that we had to reform our broken immigration system. And so I was fortunate to be able to uh, serve as the uh, chair for the section on adolescent health for two terms and as a member of the executive committee for multiple terms. And so I had an opportunity to really understand how the academy uh, operates, what the leadership structure is, and um, and to really work within the organization. And I think that our, our, our section put in resolution after resolution on health disparities and urban youth and youth of color. 
And they would always be approved by the body at the annual leadership forum, but consistently they never made it into the top 10. I worked with former president uh, Renee Jenkins and some others um, on, and we did basically a learning tour and we did these sessions at pediatric academic societies meeting, at the AEP meeting, at the National Medical Association's pediatric meeting, um, to really understand what it would take for us to really make shifts around racism. And this occurred really after the Freddie Gray incident in Baltimore. And what we found was that, you know, ultimately the academy said, you know, this is great, definitely need to do something. Unfortunately, there's no policy on it. And if there's no policy on it, we can't move forward. And so then begun this process of submitting a, a idea to write this policy statement, because I think the data was clear on what we needed to do. And so I was fortunate to partner with uh, Jackie Duje and Danielle Dooley as my writing partners after submitting the first pass of this to the AAP. And I think we produced a wonderful product um, that has now had tremendous impact. You know, it's been downloaded full text over 170, almost 170,000 times um, since its publication um, not so long ago. And what's more exciting for me is that when you hear as the previous president, this was a shift for me last summer, um, she, she came to the National Medical Association and she said, we must dismantle racism at every level from every institutional to systemic. She said that the American Academy of Pediatrics was gonna be a critical player essentially in, 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 move, in getting rid of racism. It was a powerful thing. And the CEO, uh, Mark Del Monte, you know, says that the admission of the AAP can't be accomplished when structural racism deprives too many children of a fair chance. And he says, we have always taken on complex threats to children's health and we don't flinch from this one. And it represented a real shift in the academy in terms of what we are doing um, and the work we're doing. It's in the pillars now. It is like a part of what they talk about at the board meeting. And that for me is transformative. It means that whatever small part that I played in that process is effective. It gave the academy a template. It even has its own its tagline, racism harms the health of children, teens, and families. That's when you know that I feel that your work is having an impact. So it's interesting when we talk about race, though, because race is a social construct. Um, people say, well, I see people, you know, I see the differences in people. And I think it's an important point to make. Uh, but the reality, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But the reality is that race in the United States, though, is a social construct. It changes too much. Things that are fixed and permanent, whether they're based on what you see or not, um, are, don't change that often, right? They don't, don't actually change. So initially, race was based on freedom when you look at the census over time. And then as America became more diverse, um, it tended to be what you, a combination of what you see or, and how you label that and the country of origin that people um, emerge from. The challenge is that race over time and because it was initiated in this underlying construct of freedom, um, it affects education, employment, it affects income and wealth, criminal justice interactions and housing, and those things um, affect children but we also see how it affects access to care and then the health and developmental outcomes for young people. And so, you know, I am with Francis Collins, you know, he is the person um, that has done all of this work on um, the human genome, biological factors and health. And he says very clearly that race and ethnicity are poorly defined terms that serve as flawed surrogates for multiple environmental and genetic factors and disease causation, including ancestral geography, origins, socioeconomic status, education, and access to care. And that in research, we have to move beyond these weak and imperfect proxy relationships to define more proximate factors that influence health. So essentially, we all, you know, his data suggests we all come from a common ancestor, but there are these changes that have occurred in us over time that have allowed us to survive different climates as we migrate um, and essentially to survive. But that our, our genome is pretty much 99.9% .9 the same. And we spend so much time focused on that one, that 0.1%, those climbs, those are the things that we see, eye color, hair color, hair texture um, that belong, that occur in groupings of people. Those are just superficial things that actually don't really separate us that much. There's just one human race. There's just one human race. That's why we can procreate and have children. It's, it's essentially 
we're making up these divisions um, and they're changing our society and now they've changed our health. And there are these levels of racism, really any rism, any ism, you know, homophobia, racism, misogyny, you know, they, all of these things can be a part of it. But they can be institutional, they can be personally mediated or internalized. So institutional or, or, or what you think about a structural racism, there are things that are actually legal that people are doing, decisions, policy decisions that people are making. Then there are those things that are personally mediated. So you, you so I'm at work and you have uh, you say something that's inappropriate to me, you call me a bad name, I'm on the school ground and you bully me. Those are personally mediate things. Um, internalized is when I see so much negativity about people who are like me that I begin to think negative things about myself. And then when we look at the timeline of institutionalized or structural racism, it's really, it's really very significant in the United States. Um, we think about chattel slavery. People think about 1619 as the date, but it, slavery started as early as 1501 in the Caribbean and the Americas um, and continued until 1865. Um, Naturalization Act, only Europeans could become uh, US citizens. 1830, Indian Removal Act and the Homestead Act. So 1830, we move all the Native American populations west of the Mississippi as the and something that resulted called the Trail of Tears because so many Native Americans died during that process. Can you imagine being an East Coast person um, living in, say, my home state of North Carolina with plenty of um, temperate weather, um, fishing on one end, great hunting, and then suddenly you're in the harsh Midwest. I mean, that is what essentially happened to that population. Um, then we look at the, in the Homestead Act, which basically meant that the land that they then moved to could be then parsed out and given to other people at very little cost if they could settle it. Um, then there are Jim Crow laws, um, basically separating things in an unequal way, though they called it separate but equal. Um, then there's Mexican repatriation. So Mexican Americans were at one point considered white and then uh, then they were, um, people decided they didn't need Mexican Americans in the United States anymore. And so they, they began repatriating people and changing the identity, um, which became really complex um, battle, I think, for, the, for, for Chicanos and the United States. Then there's USDA loan discrimination. So African-Americans couldn't get loans, but if you own land, the way you survive as a farmer is you borrow money against your land, you plant your crops. When your crops come in, you pay the loans back. And if you can't get a low interest loan, um, you're not able to participate in that process. And so many people lost their farms. Then there's Social Security Act and the Wagner Act. So people who worked as domestics and on farms uh, could not get Social Security. They could not uh, form unions, which is the Wagner Act. And then 1937, we have Federal Housing Administration just um, create these low interest loans and redlining of neighborhoods as they build suburbs and they develop cities. Um, and essentially um, it, it, the, the housing in the United States actually transformed um, the wealth or accentuated the wealth gap in the United States in part because of who could actually participate in home ownership and what the value of their property was. Um, 1942, we have the internment of Japanese Americans. Uh, 1944, we have the GI Bill, but they it adhered to, to rules around um, segregation. And so um, not everyone received the benefits device, despite serving overseas in wars, they, people could not uh, reap the full benefits of society. And so over time, those things build up and they impact that how people are able to survive. And I think one of the things that it uh, impacts is wealth in the United States. And so there are significant differences in, in median wealth in the United States. So the median white family, the median wealth in the United States for white families, I think is around $170,000. And for African-American families, it's around $17,000. And so what you see is that uh, studying hard and working hard enough are just not sufficient. People say, pull up your bootstraps, but it's very hard for um, populations that don't have boots to pull up those straps. Um, there's just no equalizers for wealth, not education, not employment, not family income. They're not these intergenerational wealth transfers um, that people can move forward to help them move into their future. Um, and there's also absence of wealth to draw upon in a crisis. So as an example, uh, one of the, the, I can think of a, 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 a situation where um, there is a family student connected to our team and a uh, young person got a full scholarship to college and uh, full ride talented brilliant person and um, the student didn't have the $500 matriculation fee so 
all of the tuition, all of the housing, everything is paid for except $500. So I think that particular student had a team of doctors who loves their family and loves her. And so we were able to raise the money probably in 30 minutes um, to support the student, but other families don't have that kind of access. And so we have to think about how many times that occurs in the United States for families in that, in that particular scenario. And I don't want to exclude thinking carefully also about Native American populations as an example. I work very closely with African American populations because of the demographics of Baltimore and the general DC Baltimore metropolitan area. But when we look at, you know, um, Indian Removal Act, the Homestead Act, which I've already discussed, and the issue of Native American boarding schools where children were taken out of the community, uh, the underfunding continuing now of the Indian Health Service, um, environmental justice issues that are ongoing, um, pandemic support, which is troubling. I'm so excited because one of my um, former medical students emailed me yesterday and told me that she took a job sight unseen to work um, on the Indian Health Service. So, so proud of her. Um, but in terms of their clinical access to care, in terms of what's happening to their students who live in remote areas without internet access, what has happened to their education over the last year? Voting rights, People have mailboxes because they live in remote areas. And so now because they don't have a house address, their, their ability to vote in elections was being taken away. Um, and then the whole issue around racial appropriation. I think people don't think very much about it. Um, you know, um, they see it as an ode to those populations, but oftentimes the things that are celebrated by the larger community represent death and destruction of the Native American community. Um, but racism is a determinant of health. Is a determinant of health. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the studies. Um, I had did so in the policy statement, but not going to review all of them here. I just show you the slide there that you know the systematic review was really a powerful. Um, force for me just in terms of thinking about these issues. Uh, racism is associated with poor mental health, such as depression, anxiety, and psychological distress, poor general health, and poor physical health. Um, people say, well, you know, this groundbreaking statement, this landmark statement that you had the opportunity to write, Dr. Trent, you know, um, you know, why didn't we know this before? I think we did know it before. We've known it for a long time. This is just one page of the studies from the systematic review that outlines the relationship between racism and adverse um, as it relates to health outcomes. They're just pages and pages of them. And so I think that, that work was done by many people before me. Um, I think one of the challenges for me is that I'm also seeing that um, uh, African American populations were traditionally thought to not um, to well people may experience depression were less likely to, for example, commit suicide. And I think what we're seeing now is an uptick in suicides in um, African American populations that is extremely disturbing um, uptick in substance use that is extremely disturbing. Um, and um, for example, in Baltimore, we have the highest rates of suicide in Maryland, um, and particularly amongst young people um, who are African American. And so that's a real shift in, I think, the epidemiological data from a mental health perspective. The other thing is, I think that there are challenges to, to white youth. I don't think I alluded to it before, but the the, it really impacts them when we are not all together, or as particularly as grownups, when we can't get it together to create a diverse society that functions civilly and well. Um, I, I think in this case of a, of a young girl, a mother wrote a story about how her daughter came home one day, her best friend is African-American, and, and a kid called her, 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 her best friend a name on the bus. Um, and the, the mom, who's white, um, asked her daughter, so what did you do? And the daughter said, I just sat there and hurt with her. And so I think when we it, when, when we are in this 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 heterogeneous society and we create relationships across society, um, across groups that are these these sort of made up groups <laughs> that um, that what we do is, is we create trauma for our children. And so um, this study that I mentioned here is one where they ask people, ask young people, young adults to recall um, incidents in childhood of trauma, um, of bullying, of, of um, abuse, different things, including, including uh, around um, bullying around um, race and other things. And what they found is that just trying to remember that incident, that you would see a physical, physiologic response in those folks that is akin to that of a first responder to a major disaster like an earthquake 
like an earthquake in, in uh, San Francisco that they still remember. So those events, those traumatizing events where they just watch somebody else in distress, not their own trauma, but they see it. Those things young people carry with them. So when we, when people show disrespect to others, do tra engage in traumatizing behavior to others, young people from those groups remember. And so if you think back to, for example, lynchings in the South or the Midwest with that, where they also occurred, they would often have children standing there. It'd be a celebratory um, picnic festival where they watch a human being hang. There's a generation of grownups out there who are traumatized and impacted by that. It may have even affected their worldview in, in a multitude of ways. And people say, well, how does it work in children? And so I'm driven to the work of Jane Elliott for this was a third grade teacher in Iowa um, when Martin Luther King um, was assassinated and she was just outraged by it all and she really wanted to teach her white students about race and so she divided her class up by eye color and she assigned um, different groups different levels of privilege. So in the first day she assigned the children with the brown the blue eyes the privilege, you know blue eyed children were special they were better they could line up for lunch first they could go out to recess first if they got something right of course it's because they have blue eyes. And then the reverse was true. The brown eyed children were last to go out. Uh, they, they missed the question. Of course you missed it because you have brown eyes. Um, they got something right, it was virtually ignored. So it was just a strategy. And she did it for one day, the first day. By the end of the first day, um, there was a superiority complex that the, that the children with, with blue eyes had. But by the end of the day, the brown eyed children were demoralized. Their self-esteem was infected. This is just one school day. Um, you saw this change in young people. And, and then she reversed it the next day. And then I think that the blue eyed people realized the injustice of it all. And I think it was an opportunity for people to reflect on how when you assign privileges on arbitrary um, physical characteristics, how it has the potential to change. And I guess for me, I'm asking you to consider what generations of that has done to children particularly those of color who were in those disenfranchised groups, what it did to their parents, what it did to their grandparents, what it did to their parents, and how that and how those things have been passed <laughs> as a part of intergenerational um, um, transfers to their children, um, both in terms of uh, their well-being, health status, wealth status, all of those things have become transferred. The other thing is, you know, we've also known for a long time, I just want to um, give a shout out to the work of Kenneth and Mamie Clark, Dr. Kenneth and Mamie Clark, who did some of the groundbreaking work that was used as a part of the, the case, the Brown versus the Board of Education, that really demonstrated the harmful impacts of segregation on children. Um, and um, I was moved by this, um, I'm not going to show you the film, but I put the link here um, by this, a teenager, probably about 15 years ago, I think, maybe it's 10 to 15 years ago um, as a part of a school project that she was working on with real works team filmmaking um, repeated the doll test as a part of a of a um of a little film that she made. And um, she found that, and what was disturbing is like in the film, um, like in the work of Drs. Clark, um, she found that children in contemporary times still hold significant internalized racism. Um, they still prefer the white doll um, because that doll, they have already been taught, these are young children, like five or six years old, they've already been taught um, before they even really start kindergarten. That, that, that black is bad and that white is good is what one child specifically says. Yet they understand that the black child is the one that looks like them. It's a really powerful film to watch. I really would encourage you to do it. Um, her work was featured at the Smithsonian's um, um, exhibit on race. It was very powerful to see a teenager step into that space in that way and to replicate the work of some real heroes in, in sociological literature. And that social isolation and stigmatization is significant. I'm drawn to the work of um, uh, Liz Goodman's team um, where they really demonstrated even now that it's not just poverty, because I think we focused on poverty for a long time because that was something that could be universal in child health that was affecting outcomes. Um, this work by um, uh, this team really demonstrated that children of educated parents um, were the ones more likely to experience significant depression. And so oftentimes because they were being put into spaces that um, where there were fewer people who were like them um, with protective effects and they often experienced um, maltreatment in that space, that space and pressure in a different sort of way. 
Um, it's also affected Asian American populations um, just in terms of how they reflect. And this is a really powerful piece that um, was published in the in Time magazine, um, um, really focused on racism during the pandemic and um, the need for equality. Um, the stigmatization associated with COVID-19 could, could really be significant um, to some people who have sometimes been verbally, um, physically attacked um, um, based on it. And um, we often see as well that the experience of discrimination um, amongst Chinese American adolescents specifically um, have consequences for their social, emotional, and academic development. I've not heard people talk a lot about the impacts on this population, um, but I do know that in places like Boston, there are these, these enclaves of populations um, that exist and that we have to be very thoughtful about protecting them. And I also understand what the sparks are that young people need to thrive. Um, they have to be adaptable and flexible, have a sense of purpose, be hopeful um, for the future, optimistic, free of worries and concerns, have life satisfaction, not be depressed, feel healthy, um, feel happy. Um, but they also have to have a strong sense of their ethnic identity. And in the United States, what people found is that people actually have some some bias towards themselves. They have to have some sense of this, this strength. Um, this um, they have to be socially cult. You know, it has to be this cultural socialization, uh, racial socialization, or ethnic socialization that's really important uh, because it protects them when they face those challenges. I also just wanted to mention that there are significant impacts on maternal dis discrimination on health. I think the health of mothers, um, I know people often say happy, <laughs> happy wife, happy life, but the reality is that happy mom, happy baby, right? And so when they looked at qualitative research with women, um, with um, um, moms, they actually found that women reported of color experienced um, racism across their life of course, but they found that the childhood events with the most salient and enduring, which is consistent with what I shared with you earlier about the impacts of trauma bystander and their experiences individually on young people as they move forward. They experienced it back directly and they also experienced vicarious racism through their child, that it was interpersonal, institutional and internalized. It was across life domains in the community and at work that they sometimes had active and other times had passive responses to it. But they developed this, this pervasive vigilance that they were always anticipating threats for themselves and their child. And in a quantitative study of women's health across the nation, um, they really looked at this bio measure of aging and they found that African-American women in particular are about seven and a half years older due to stress. And so it's these things that impact um, on maternal health and people really wonder why is it regardless of, 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 of socioeconomic status that African-American women have the highest infant mortality rate um, and the wealthy, one of the wealthiest countries in the world and it's, and it's and, and so in part, I believe, due to these stressors that bear down on them across the life course that, that go unaddressed in society. And so you're not surprised by the infant mortality rates that we see. And, you know, I think that there are these challenges. This is a case from New York City where a mom was literally harassed and no one would come to her defense she moved into a suburb with her child and she was harassed these are the kinds of experiences that african-american mothers can face um, uh, they actually told her to stop calling the police and until she videotaped the abuse um, and it went viral in the news um, no one believed her she literally had purchased a home and then was um, in fear of her life um, at home and then what we've also seen is that in recent years, um, there's this protective effect. The Latino paradox found that immigrant women really had healthy babies. They did really well um, from a maternal child health perspective. But a recent study actually found that um, US immigration um, enforcement policies are now impacting the health of Latino mothers, both foreign and US born. And so in a really short period of time, we've already erased sort of the protective effects that um, particularly immigrant Latina moms and first generation moms um, really have experienced. And, and that's really sad. And that we know we've seen has been very structural um, here in the United States. 
So what can pediatric practitioners do? We can optimize the pediatric and public health workforce, optimize workforce development, professional education, optimize systems through community engagement, advocacy, and public policy, and we can optimize research. Um, there are tools out there for us to use. This is a great um, a thing to think about for, that the American Public Health Association has published. Uh, there are things that we do. So as an example, in our clinic, uh, we realized that uh, we have transportation deserts. I lived in Boston for three years and I can tell you, I got everywhere on the bus and the train, even as a, as a fellow. Uh, was not a challenge for me at all. But in Baltimore, our patients don't have that luxury. And so we've, an example of something we've done is we've developed a, a, um, a relationship with the rideshare company so that we could begin to address it. And what we found is that young people are coming to our space from all over the city, but we've seen, um, while there's slight decrease during COVID, it has not, it's not statistically significant. People still need transportation um, during COVID. And so we have to think about what are the factors that are affecting our ability to deliver care to their patients. For us, we found that one of those is transportation. I'll just put up here, I'm not, I took the person's name off, but I came across this the other day because somebody said, so right now people in Massachusetts, and you just announced it earlier, that 75 and up can be vaccinated, right? And in the month or so 65 and up will be vaccinated but it's um but that in Roxbury the life expectancy is just 59 years so I'm always suspicious when I see things on social media so I had to go check it and and the uh, Virginia um <laughs> they did the and I pulled up the research and it's true the life expectancy is 58.9 years in, in um, Roxbury and as somebody who worked at, a, I used to work at Roxcomp um, because they didn't have a pediatrician, I moonlighted there um, as a pediatrician at night providing primary care to children in that community. And so I just thought to myself, so a community that has a life expectancy of 59, that no red flag is raised that those people don't have access to vaccine earlier than that, probably living in generational households. So from a public health perspective, they're totally out of the mix. It just, it, it raised a red flag for me in terms of how we think about public health planning and what's gonna to happen to that community and COVID. I think we also have to identify our blind spots. So this is this is me when I was a fellow here in Boston. Um, we lived in um, Brookline and um, I, I will tell you that um, not all racial differences is explained by poverty and there are stresses of living and working in a world where you're continually demeaned in small ways and large that have an effect on your body. And for me, I think one of the most salient experiences that I had as a fellow is just getting our car going to Costco in Dedham. Um, we lived in Cleveland Circle at the time and then we moved out to Brookline, uh, further out to Chestnut Hill. But um, as a result of this, but a police officer walked up to my husband and, um, and I was there too, um, as we we're getting in our car to go to Costco to get our groceries and told him, you know, PhD college professor that he met the description of a suspect, a hand on his holster. It was a powerful transformative thing to be stopped in front of your home and that you're overpaying for uh, this tiny apartment and getting in your car and to be told that you don't fit there. And so I think that these experiences not just don't just happen to the people who live in low income communities or segregated communities. Um, they happen to all of us as we move through society. And I think that I don't know that I ever told anybody in my fellowship program, maybe the people just closest to me, but I think it was a transformational moment that says something about whether or not this could be a place that I could raise children. And people say, well, what can I do? And everybody loves that meme of Bernie Sanders that's been going around of him sitting a little grumpily um, at the inauguration. But I think I remember, I, someone shared this with me and I think it was a powerful statement. I think sometimes you have to sit in there with people. Um, I love that he's in here with this person um, and that they're together. So he sat in, in other places and really has stood his ground, which I found very powerful. There are also things that you can do. I received this from a colleague the day after the uh, insurrection in, um, in Washington, DC. And she said, hi, Maria, if I can ever use my unearned privileges to give you some of your hard fought ones or help keep you and your kids safe, please know what an honor it would be. And so this is one of my colleagues, this white woman stepping out of her comfort zone. And, and she's not in my, on my team or in the space, but we know each other because of other work that we do. And she thought about 
our family. And I think that that's a really powerful thing, particularly as, you know, just 30 miles away, you have um, our, our nation's capital under siege. I think the Academy has also stepped into that space and done that as well um, around truth and reconciliation, um, has changed their bylaws um, to include anti-discrimination measures. We have to be prepared to talk about racism with young people, to teach them how to read it, to name it appropriately, to oppose it and replace it. We can't expect them to do it by themselves. I am all about youth development and strength-based approaches, but there are times when we have to step in um, to lead and to protect, not just scaffold them. We also have to think about our workforce development. So to, to think about ways to address implicit biases and improve in healthcare that diversify the workforce and public health and, and in pediatrics and provide the professional education folks need. We have to train the ne next generation to be better. We spend a lot of time making sure everybody's CPR up to date, PALS up to date, um, ACLS if you're on the adult side. Um, but do we use those same services and it, um, to train people to how to communicate cross-culturally. So one of the things that we have done at Hopkins is we have a simulation series where we're able to actually put people in the Sim Center and to have them experience, I think, um, cross-cultural communication, to give them feedback, to use interpreters. Um, and I think residents and fellows have said that this is, this is really transformative for them. They say it's the first time they've actually been to a cultural competency seminar where they learned something. And what we see in just three hours is that we have to make the cases um, more difficult um, for the interpret interpreter services um, if after they've done the other two simulations. And so we can actually change their behavior in a really short period of time. Uh, we also have to optimize systems through public community engagement, advocacy, public policy and research. Think about education policy, strategies for school and community policing, strategies for incarceration, non -strat alternatives to policing and, and incarceration, improve public health policies for disease control, and to design innovative strategies to really mitigate the impacts of racism on children and adolescents. Essentially, I'm asking you all to become more powerful on behalf of children and adolescents. I never ask people to do things I'm not willing to do. I testified before the school board. I testified at congressional hearings. I testified briefings to help um, people go in before they are going to testify. I write to the newspaper. I think that those are the things, all things that everyone can do to stand in the fray to protect children and adolescents. We also talk about the stuff that matters. So um, recently we talked with our city council president, now mayor of Baltimore, um, the police uh, lieutenant colonel. We brought in people from the community, we brought in young people, and we had a panel that we watched the film Charm City, which is very focused on policing. And we had a discussion about it. And it was with our residents, our fellows, our faculty, uh, folks from the community. And it was really very powerful experience, I think, for our group. And one of the what I hope to be a series of discussions we're going to have um, between Hopkins and the community. So in conclusion, racism is a social determinant of health. It impacts the emotional and physical health of children, adolescents, adults, and families. Uh, you serving professionals play a vital role in preventing and mitigating the impact of racism through examining their personal biases, um, clinical and public health practice, advocacy and research and, and community-based engagement. There are daily policy threats to the well-being of children in pediatric practice, in school, and in communities. COVID-19 has just uncovered the flaws in the US public health priorities and systems and the remnants of historical and current racism. The AAP policy statement on racism and its impact on child and adolescent health really just provides recommendations to help professionals address racism, but it's now time for us to do the work at the local level. So I just wanted to acknowledge um, all the people that have been really instrumental in helping me do this work. Um, certainly Danielle and Jackie for, for their uh, work and, and being in there to write and respond to all their critique and criticism is a tough process to go through the AAP. Um, Jessica Daniels at Boston Children's uh, for really uh, working with me and steering me in this direction. <laughs> and then certainly um, um, others um, who have been really very instrumental. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. So I'm going to uh, ask uh, Priya, uh, Priya to, uh, to moderate this, but um, sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, let me first just start by thanking you. You've clearly uh, expanded our understanding of the impact of racism uh, on, on health. And 
I think for me, what's made it most impactful is that you've animated the data with stories um, and really brought it to life. And these issues uh, are, are clearly so important. So you, you ended uh, by talking about the local level, but we're now at the, uh, at the beginning of a new uh, administration with uh, a very different approach. So I wonder what perhaps your two or three top priorities are for this administration to, uh, to take on and, and change. You know, it's interesting. I think that this current administration has so many issues to take on um, <laughs> from the economic perspective, from a public health safety perspective, from a climate change perspective, all of those things are going to affect child health. I think right now, it's interesting because I think we sort of see that the, the ebb and flow of politics and how it affects the population. But I think right now, I think until we get COVID-19 under control, how, until we vaccinate not just our, our older citizens and our, our, you know, our essential workforce, but we really do make sure that we get everybody um, safe, get our young people back to school, um, sports, the things that matter for them. I think that our society is gonna be challenged. Uh, we see the impacts on mothers. Um, there's good data that demonstrates that women in the workforce are you know, tremendously impacted by what is happening from a COVID-19 perspective and um, are challenged to both be home and be present. Um, even dads who do that work, that they've actually demonstrated that men in the workplace who are able to telecommute actually spend about an hour more on childcare duties than they did before. So I think that um, while I think those things are, it's important for families to be with their children, I think that there are spaces, my adolescent should be in school right now. She should not, both of them should not be here. One of them listening to my talk right now. They <laughs> should actually be, um, they should be in school. They should be taking orchestra in person. Um, they should be playing sports with their sports team. Um, and I think that those, I think we have to get we have to get out of COVID-19. I think once we do that, we'll also see our economy improve. I think economies, particularly in urban communities, have the potential to affect crime and, um, and, and the lifestyle that people feel like they may have to resort to. So I think we also have to deal with that from an economic perspective, like COVID will affect that. Um, I think there are challenges around social justice um, that remain, they go unresolved. And so I think how we handle um, the next, this current activity in Congress um, could have an impact on social justice issues. So, you know, it's interesting. I could, I could probably talk all day. Um, they have so much work ahead of them. But I have to say that I am optimistic um, that they are looking for people who have the expertise to help make transformational change. They actually have an expert on race, as an example, who is helping to work on economic policies and the COVID-19 policies. So I, I think that the I'm optimistic, but I, I think we still got a lot of work to do. Me too. Thank you. Priya, do you want to take us through the chat? Sure. Um, and then I know there's some hands that are raised, but I'll start with the chat questions first. Um, so the first question, Dr. Trent, is uh, do you have thoughts on how public financing of child health reinforces racial justice? So I think that um, I'm not sure what they mean by that, um, in part because I think one of the things that we've seen is that um, public health insurance for example, um, and social welfare programs, although there have been, th their policies have undermined the family a bit, um, that they may actually, that it's improved health overall. It's certainly improved health access. So I don't know if that person can unmute themselves and let me know what they were thinking um, so that I could be more thoughtful in my response. Uh, Maria, this this is Jim Perrin. Uh, thank you so much for being here and, and giving this remarkable talk. Uh, the How issue on awesome. public, public financing really is that, uh, you know, 35 or 40 percent of America's kids are covered by Medicaid and CHIP. And that's much better than if they weren't covered at all. Uh, on the other hand, Medicaid and CHIP, which is disproportionately kids of color, uh, also pays in general about two thirds the rates of, say, Medicare. So we value Medicaid children at about two thirds the value of a real person. What does that mean? So that is a huge issue. So that means that the type of health care that they can access, the quality of care they can access um, is a challenge. Who accepts 
balance Medicaid is a challenge. So I, I agree with you that that may influence, well, it definitely will influence sort of um, services. I think the other challenge is there are spaces in which um, there may not be any coverage at all. So as an example of that in the state of Maryland, what we see is that they set the rates for coverage of substance abuse services in adolescents um, so low that no facility now will take an adolescent for inpatient um, substance use or um, um, disorder treatment or addiction medicine treatment in a facility. There are no beds in the state of Maryland because the rates are so low. So I think you raise the, the payment rates are so low that they can't afford to keep the adolescent units open. And so I think that you're absolutely correct in, in terms of doing in, in terms of your point um, in that it undercuts access. So I think access is important. <laughs> so I think we can agree there, but I definitely think that how people value those people who receive it and the services and the underpayment um, ices them out of care. Um, for the next question, we have, how can we ensure that major teaching hospitals like MGH and Johns Hopkins actually provide equitable access to healthcare for underprivileged patients consistent with the ideals articulated by their mission statements by the AAP and Mr. Hopkins over a century ago. Right. So that whole free care thing has fallen by the wayside. So they definitely charge people for their services, um, though they have a community benefits program. But, you know, I think a number of people have actually begun to examine um, how well they're doing. They've set up metrics for institutions, actually a team in Massachusetts. Some of the hospitals have actually set up these quality indicators um, for their institutions and have looked at them across health equity. So, I, I, you know, how well are their patients with asthma doing? How well are their patients with cancer doing? How well are their patients um, in delivery of primary care services doing? So they actually look at those metrics to determine whether or not there's inequity and they try to address them. Um, one of the programs here at um, um, Children's National Health System had, had a program around asthma and found that there was inequity. And they created a solution um, that was community engaged to address it. So I think we have to collect the data, look at the data and decide that we're gonna do something about it. It does require institutional investments if you're gonna have any type of project or program um, to change. Um, I think that's the other challenge that institutions are facing right now, particularly given um, the economic impacts of COVID-19 um, on um, health outcomes. Uh, children may not be as sick, but that means they're also not coming for care as often. Oscar, did you want to uh, ask a question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Trent, for coming. I really uh, uh, learned quite a bit. Uh, with respect to, this is almost a follow on uh, to Dr. Perrin's question in terms of financing of, of healthcare. And, you know, I think a lot of the discussion has been around physicians, physician policy, Clearly, we're part of the um, that that puzzle. But I'm just wondering: Have we engaged uh, private health insurance, or has health insurance um, uh, been engaged in any way to address uh, health inequity and quantify it in some way? So I think that some insurers are doing it. I think that many insurers like to look at quality indicators every year. So every year they want to know how well we're doing on certain measures. And if we're not doing well, certainly from a public health insurance perspective, um, then we could be penalized if we're not doing the things that we say we're doing. I'm not sure for me that I like the, the, the stick approach because it does require per, um, patient and parent behavior to navigate those. Um, so I think oftentimes they see that as their way of holding us accountable. But I think that there's some insurers that have partnered with us to actually probably more so on the local level to address these issues. But I do think that they have national quality indicators. Um, and I think we have to begin to hold people accountable for it uh, without actually putting barriers into place. So I think some of that work is being done. I don't know that universally it's being trickled impacting institutions in a way that um, that the next the first the person who just asked the question described. Thank you. Is that helpful? Uh, yes, uh, it is helpful. Well, I guess just getting to those quality indicators. I mean, one of them could be measurement of, of health inequity, um, whether it's, you know, people on the appropriate blood pressure medication or a child referred to um, and to be on the appropriate uh, uh, you know, asthma inhalers. So is that what you mean by um, inequality indicators? I mean, does that exist in terms of measurement of that health inequity and using that health inequity as the, the disease being treated? 
Yes, and so that now, so I just received the med the draft of the measures. So a team here is actually working with um, with the uh, Bloomberg work that we have here at Hopkins to develop to look at um, measures of quality around um, community engagement for institutions, and um, they tend to be things that people are hospitalized for, which may miss some of the things that we need to look at in ambulatory care to prevent people from needing hospitalizations. But I think that it's a first pass that's going to change how we look at child and adolescent health care from a hospital's perspective. I do think additional work needs to be done to incorporate ambulatory care um, components because I think we're a critical piece in helping to shape the need for hospitalization at all. Great, thank you. So we're right up uh, at the hour now. Uh, so I wanna thank you again for uh, a wonderful talk and a wonderful conversation. Um, thanks for joining us and thanks for inspiring us. Yep, you all have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.